All right, we laid the foundation last year as we looked at um, how the Bible teaches us about Bible principles and then convictions and standards, and now we're going through some topics. Um, if you've missed one of the weeks on music, I would encourage you to go on live stream, and that's on YouTube or Facebook Live, and maybe catch up on what we're looking at. Um, it is a very controversial topic because people are in love with their music. They're in love with their music. It may not be God's music. It may not be right music, but they're in love with their music. And I'm okay. I think you noticed that last week to uh, try to tell what the Bible says, teach what it says. And if it steps on your toes, I apologize now. No, I don't. No, I don't. All right? If the Bible steps on our toes, no apology necessary, needed, or required, or offered. All right? If the Bible steps on our toes, we ought to do What? Move our toes. All right? The Bible steps on your toes. Move your toes. What do we do typically when the Bible steps on our toes? I'll tell you. Kick the Bible. If we can't do that, we kick the messenger. But our toes stay in the same place. Unfortunately, too often. We're not willing to change if the Bible says that. Though we say we're Christians and we love the Bible, if the Bible really, you know, we'll, we'll mask it in a level of spirituality. Well, well, I think the Bible says something differently. Oh, really? What does it say? Well, that's your, that's your, uh, that's your interpretation. Great. What's your other interpretation? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have those conversations with us. Uh, I just want us to follow what the Bible says and uh, apply it to our lives. And so we had some questions come in last week. I'm going to read through them briefly. I'm not going to answer them all tonight. Some will be answered in the next couple weeks as we finish kind of laying the foundation for this and then giving some takeaways. My plan in this is to about probably two or maybe three more weeks laying the foundations for this, and then I'll give us the takeaways. What, how do we then apply this to our lives? I'm laying foundation blocks right now. And if your questions are not answered, I don't think they're sufficiently answered, I will go through them in detail to make sure that, that we get these questions that I think are necessary for us answered. And we had some good questions coming last week, question like this, is it okay to play secular or non-Christian music when learning an instrument? All right, absolutely good, a good question. We're going to look at uh, some of that, that concept. Where does classical music fit in? All right, where does it fit in? Well, I think we'll cover that then this week or next week. Are, are Barney the Dinosaur songs appropriate? This is why we don't have live questions. Because there's one in every crowd. I don't know who you are, but I may have passed Dylan and find out who you are. I may just answer it standing in front of you on the pew. <laughs> no, Arthur, I'm just kidding. And, and, and you should know that kid about that. But listen, don't be afraid to, ask, to submit a question. All right, I don't know who submitted these. All right, but he is here's question. Ask it. It is a uh, it is similar to uh, uh, Planet Fitness in that we call it judgment free zone. All right, I, I am not afraid of the truth. All right, uh, the truth can defend itself, and I'm happy for you to ask the question. Sometimes we have questions that are legitimate questions, and we're afraid what will people think if I ask that question? They're gonna think, oh, what a terrible person. You must listen to crazy, terrible, ungodly music. Well, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But I have found the truth can defend itself, stand for itself, and often people, good people, respond to truth. And so please don't be afraid. I won't tease you. I won't even call you out on that. Um, are there any musical instruments that are always off limits? Another great question. And they said, for example, electric guitar. There's certain types of drums. It's a good question, right? Is there anything that's ever just off limits? Does all music have to be religious in nature? Or can a song or music be inappropriate at church? but still appropriate at home. I think we covered that some last week. There's acceptability and appropriate things. Our acceptability would be on the table of what God has deemed to be acceptable. All right? There are certain things that are off the table of acceptability. And we'll look at more of that, but certain genres of music, certain styles of music, certain lyrics in music that are off the table that have no part, zero part in a Christian's life. But on this table, there's other stuff that may not be wise for me. It may not be wise for a church setting. We talked about this last week. Uh, there's some good songs that I wouldn't play on Resurrection Sunday, Easter morning, that I wouldn't play at your funeral. It's not appropriate. All right? Um, 
And then some of the questions that they just did tonight, we'll look at those. So those are some questions that we will look at. We're going to continue on. If you have your Bibles, open to Psalm chapter number 40, please. We looked at this one briefly last week, Psalm chapter 40, as we continue on on some of these foundations. We've hit this kind of this foundation already, and I think we've, I've proven it effectively that, number one, the Bible does speak of music. All right? It's not a no-brainer. I want to establish that foundation clearly. The Bible speaks of music. In fact, it speaks of music more than heaven and hell. I'm not saying that heaven and hell is less important than music. I'm just saying that the Bible speaks more of, the, of music than that. The Bible speaks of music, and music is important in the Bible. That is vital for us to understand and agree upon. All right, if we deem music to be unimportant in our lives, then we will not make, I believe, the right decisions. It's a unnecessary thing. Who cares? Well, I'm, I'm arguing that the Bible cares and God cares. We've uh, talked about this, that the Bible speaks of good music and bad music. The Bible speaks of it, right? It does not name artists in the Bible. All right, anyone who says that is lying to you. Well, if you take the Hebrew letters and take every fourth letter and put it into a, you know, a, a, a crossword puzzle and line up the up and the downs, you find this name. Maybe you've heard these gentlemen, or I don't know, women, gentlemen. It's not true. The Bible's not a hidden code. God did not give the Bible like the Da Vinci Code to hide it. He gave us true some as mysteries. Paul says that, all right? But they're clearly taught mysteries, all right? It's not that we're supposed to read every third verse and every fourth word and, and assemble things. We read it like God did, like plainly, like He wrote it to us. We, and we have a rational creator for a rational mind, all right, the Bible gives us spiritual purposes to music. It teaches us, the Bible teaches us how we ought to have a corporate music program or how we ought to sing at church. The Bible teaches us that. And the Bible teaches us that music conveys, last week, a message. In Psalm chapter 40, David says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Lord, I thank you for this time we have. Lord, I pray for your help and your wisdom. Lord, I pray for understanding in our hearts and our minds. Lord, I know that, that this music, topic of music, Lord, can be very touchy and controversial. Lord, it can be extremely personal with people. And I pray that you would give us all the grace to listen with a spiritual mind and a spiritual heart in tune to your Holy Spirit. Lord, would you take the truth from your word and apply it to our hearts. Lord, help me to communicate things clearly, to avoid confusion. Lord, I love you. I thank you for what you've done for us here and what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we began to open up the idea that music has an effect. If you would turn back to Exodus chapter number 32, it ended here last week in Exodus chapter 32. It's the, the account where Moses came down from the mountain, and Joshua heard the noise that was going on. You remember that the children of Israel had all given their golden earrings and a piece of gold, a gold or a gold earring to Aaron. Aaron had thrown the gold into the fire and out popped a golden calf, Aaron's story. We've heard that story from three-year-olds before. Just happened, Daddy. I don't know what happened. It just, there it went. It just blew up. Really, you weren't touching it. And Aaron gives us that story. That just the fire, it formed a golden calf. Well, we all know that's not true. Aaron fashioned the golden calf. It was a complete and utter lie. All right? But, but on the way down, Joshua hears in Exodus chapter 32... Uh, is in verse number 17. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And Moses, as he said, is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. It came to pass as soon as he came nigh to the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. Question, why was Moses upset? He goes, what? All right, the people said they'd follow God, and what were they following? A golden calf. 
a false god. Aaron said previously in the chapter, these be the gods that brought you out of Egypt. A slap in the face to the Almighty God, who had shown his hand clearly in defeat of the Egyptians' god and goddesses in the plagues. He defeated certain Egyptian gods and goddesses. Look it up. It's, it's amazing what, how, how God orchestrated that. And God established himself as Jehovah, and the people went, went uh, uh, following a false god in just a few short weeks. And there was music that accompanied that false worship. This music sent a message, and Joshua said, it sounds like utter chaos of war. And Moses goes, oh, that's not chaos. That's singing that I hear. Their music you know, that sends a message that has no place in the Christian's life. You see, music sends a message. It's a carrier. It conveys a something. And the Bible teaches us here that music can convey the wrong message. Right? Uh, uh, Joshua was confused. Why? Because of the music. So music can be confusing. We ought to be careful in our life, in our church, to not have confusing music. Now, in a general sense, could there be music in church that would be confusing? Yes or no? Shake them around them. Could there be music? I'm not saying what it is yet. Could there be music? Could there be a, a style of music that if someone were to walk in, would not know, they would not know if this were music or some chaos. Could that be possible? Yes or no? Yes, it is possible. So if it's possible, we ought to be really careful that we're not sending the wrong message in our music. I heard this illustration. I thought it was a tremendous illustration. They talked about how music is a carrier. And they said, well, you'd never carry your lunch in the same thing that carries horse manure. Would you? It's not a bad analogy now, is it? There are certain people, we talked about this, that say music doesn't send a message. I would submit they're only carnal Christians. All right, I said that last week. Um, unsaved people understand that music sends a message. That's the point of every soundtrack in a movie, to convey a message. They, they set a mood with the music. It sends a message. In a scary scene of a movie on a soundtrack, the music does not go, da, da, ba, 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 ba. No, no, no. It's like, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. Why do they do that? Because music conveys and sends a message without any words. You could close your eyes. Do the close your eyes, and you know it's a scary scene. Commercials. The music conveys a message. At our house, we mute commercials. They'll say, well, that's really pious of you. No, it's practical of me. I already want enough things. Why do I want more things? My kids already want enough things. Why do I want them to want more things? I tell you, one commercial when they're young and they know these, this one word, two syllable or three syllable, McDonald's. Man, when they were young, what do you want to go to eat McDonald's? How do you know that, kids? They know, they know. We mute commercials. I, I would reckon if you sometimes during a commercial, if you, if you think I'm crazy, just close your eyes and listen to what's going on. And just listen to it. Forget the images for a second. You're going to hear music that most of you would never allow in your household, except it's in a commercial. So that makes it okay. Of course, it's just a commercial. Unplug my mind. Music sends a message. The Bible teaches us that. You see, there's effects of music. In, uh, in Matthew chapter 14, you don't have to turn there. That's the, the account where the daughter of Herodias dances before the king. The Bible says that it pleased her well. That word dance that she used, that's used there is used four times in Scripture. Two times, once in Matthew, once in Mark, the way Herodias' daughters danced, and two times... It's used in this context, we have piped for you, and ye have not danced. The other two times this word danced is used in context of someone saying, listen, we played music that you were supposed to dance to, and you didn't. So apparently when Herodias' daughter danced, there was music that was accompanying her dancing that pleased Herod well enough to kill John the Baptist. 
That word pleased, in the context, there is a very lustful word. It gives a connotation that her dancing was a lustful dancing. Wonder what music they would have played to have that lustful dancing. Well, they've played, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. They played that one. Rock of ages cleft for me. Of course not. Of course not. That's ridiculous, is it not? There is music that sends a a message. It has an effect. In the Old Testament, uh, we talked about this. David played and Saul had an evil or depressed spirit leave him. Another place that affected music in a, in a good sense, David was so excited, they were playing the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, t- uh, the timbrels, and they were doing all these, these, these instruments, and David was dancing before the Lord. Revelation, there's music, and the children of Israel, after the Red Sea, they won, they sang music, and the Last Supper, um, the disciples sang a hymn. There's effect of music in the Bible. Music sends a message. Then I want to continue on with this next Uh, Next thought is there's confusion in music. There's confusion in music. How many could acknowledge, yes, Pastor Howell, I can see the confusion in music. Come on, raise your hand if you ever see it. You ever, maybe in another church, well, why do they use that music and we use this music? Or why does that person listen to that and I listen to this? And there's confusion in music. Sometimes there's a confusion in teaching in music. Uh, One time I heard this. They said, rhythm in music is like salt. They said, rhythm in music is like salt. If you have too much salt, you don't want to eat the meat. Well, now, it sounds good for a second, but I'm that guy. I'm sorry, I'm that guy. Uh, Brother Eric, I'm that guy. I, I remembered this little saying of Jesus, ye are the salt of the earth. The salt is lost, it's savor, wherewith shall it be salted? And I was like, wait a second, if it's like salt and we're supposed to be salt, then I want a lot of rhythm. Well, that's not what they meant. And I'm like, that gets confusing really quick. What they meant was like, well, you can't have too many rhythm instruments in music. Someone else said this, well, if a song makes you feel like tapping your toe, it doesn't please the Lord. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Where do I start? We'll start with David dancing before the Lord. Okay, how about we start there? We can end there too. Oh boy. I'm not saying that now, now, now hear me. All right, don't don't miss this. Don't miss this. I'm not saying that there is some music like Herodias was played when her daughter danced that caused certain movements that were lustful and for her the king, all right, that are not proper. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, just to say if it causes your toe to tap, it's sinful. I'm saying that's a bad statement. Someone once said, well, play the music for a three-year-old. Okay? I don't know about your house, but my kids jump around to row, row, row your boat. (laughs) All right? And they're jumping along with that song, the Jingle Bells. All right? I'm Puerto Rican. It happens, okay? So if it's a three-year-old jumping around... Because to row, row, row your boat, well, we better mute it. All right, so it maybe, maybe, what I'm saying is, maybe it's not necessarily just if it causes your toe to tap. Or, or if I can say this, if, if maybe sometimes there's a physical response to what's being played. All right, because I look at David and I see his heart full of joy. I read the Psalm, book of Psalms, and this is a joyful book. Sometimes it start off, starts off bad, Psalm 40, and it gets good. He put a new song in my mouth, not song of defeat or depression, but of victory, all right, and, and God on our side, and they're shouting, and they're shouting. We can learn something from our southern friends. We get pretty, we get pretty uh, austere here in Michigan, don't we? It's a good song, Pastor. Amen. Touch me deep right here. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not saying we got to take laps with a potted plant. All right. But we could probably learn something about letting the joy of the Lord come from here out here. There goes Pastor Scott, the Southern accent. (laughs) I apologize. I apologize. I'm just saying that there's some confusion in music. And I'm trying to strip some of those things away to say, what does the Bible teach us? We already talked about this, that in church, 
All right, we're supposed to lift with one voice our voices to Him. Others will hear it. People ought to walk and have never been in church before and say, whoa, what is going on in the music? In the music, not in a confusing sense. They may say, wow, I've never heard that song before. Good. I hope they hear different songs at church than they hear in their car when they leave if they're unsaved. If they hear the same songs, we have a problem. That's confusing. It's confusing. Well, we put good words to it, Pastor. (laughs) I don't care if you wear a suit and a tie with it. (laughs) Music sends a message. There's confusion in music. All right, and we're trying to strip some of that away, and we've hit this before. I'm going to hit it again, though. I like to repeat myself so we don't miss it. One, the personal side of things, I like it, it must be okay. I don't like it, so it must not be okay. I don't see what's wrong with it, which makes myself the ultimate judge. So let me give you some explanations of music tonight, um, some definitions of music, and maybe give some light, some, some foundation for this as we continue to build these foundations. The definition of music, according to a couple of online and to a couple of dictionaries, is this, an art of sound that expresses ideas and emotions. An art of sound that expresses ideas and emotions. Sounds like this music, according to their definition, is a carrier, right? Expresses ideas and emotions. Vocal or instrument sounds combined in a way as to produce beauty of form, harmony, and expression of emotion. So music is combined in a way as to produce beauty. And probably the the simplest and I think one of the best definitions of music, an expression or art form. An expression or art form. Music. Music by definition would be an expression or an art form. There's this this, this statement that that, um, usually carnal not pleasing to God Christians will make in music, they say this, well, pastor, is music amoral? Huh. Music, it's amoral. You can't prove that's moral. I would argue this, music by definition has morality, by definition. I don't mind it when they ask me that question. I was asked it recently by someone in another church. That when they asked me this question, and uh, I've been asked a few times in this statement, it's not really a question, it's more like a rhetorical thing, they think they have you right then. They say, aha, I've got you in a spot. And in reality, in my mind, and I think when we're done, I think you'll see this, they think that there's no answer. They've won the argument on music. What they've done is they've just dialed and put a big billboard on their head that bing, ding, ding, I don't know music. I don't understand the Bible. And probably not life in general. Is music uh, moral? Well, music by definition is an art form. What they want to say is this. Well, you know, pastor, this, this note right here. Is that good or bad? Well, by definition, this is called middle C. It's not music. It's a tone. So if you want to have a conversation, you can argue with me, are tones moral or moral? Tones are not moral or moral. They're just tones. They're just sounds. Play them, sing them, hum them. Hmm, ha, ha. It's just a sound. Music is not just a sound. Music is an expression. Well, say, look at that, Pastor. We put them in a chord. I give you three tones. Give me a hundred tones. A tone is not music. Right, but music. Music is an expression. Now we have an expression. Some tones added together. Now we have morality attached to it. Music, uh, tone by definition, is not moral. 
But a tone is not an expression. You put tones together. And now we have, by definition, music. A chord is just tones, but structured chords are not. Now, I know I'm going to get a little bit deep on some of this, so just hang on for a second. Someone will ask, well, Pastor Howell, why, why are you talking about music? Are you even qualified? No, I'm not. There are a whole lot of people in this world smarter than me. All right, what I have done is try to study it out extensively in the Bible. Eight pages of notes, in case you're wondering. I have taken enough music classes to satisfy a music major at Bob Jones University. I've traveled in music and playing music since I was, well, I started playing trombone when I was in third grade. So that would put it around 30, 31 years now. I've studied classical, contemporary, music inside the classical music, 20th century, played in opera. I've been around music more than a lot of people. I am not an expert. I'm not an expert. Okay? I am probably better equipped than some in this room and less than others. So I fall somewhere inside that spectrum. But I can say this with authority about music, I'm not a novice. I'm not a novice. All right? I, 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 some of the day, well, uh, when I hear a song and I maybe don't like it, I can probably explain better than a lot of people what's wrong with that song. Technique, form, expression, chord structure, we're borrowing the chords from, what century they developed these chords in, why they're doing this particular rendition of the song, where it came from. Doesn't solve the ultimate problem that it's not right. All right, so we're talking about music. It's very near and dear to my heart. And I have a little bit of experience in it. I want to talk about some of the elements of music in, in the definition of an expression of art. Element number one in music, we have rhythm. Right? We know what rhythm is, right? Everybody clap for me. <laughs> off top. Oh, most of you can clap in time. There's always one in every cloud that wants to go off the beat. All right, you know what that's called? It's called syncopation, or it's called you tone deaf. No, no, it's not, it's not that. It's not tone deaf. Um, it's syncopation. Syncopation is a rhythm that's off the beat. It has been said that syncopation is wicked. I would challenge someone to listen to Beethoven. They won't say Beethoven's wicked, but syncopation is wicked. All right, now, can syncopation, can something be wicked? Yes, but it's just a beat. It's, it rhythm has duration and tempo, and every song, every music has rhythm in it. How long a note is and, and the rhythm of the song itself. Amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet. It's rhythm in the song. Every song has rhythm. Not always emphasized, but everything has rhythm in it. It's an element of music. How fast it goes, you, you retard it, or accelerando, you go faster, or freely, everything has rhythm. Though the element of music, there's dynamics, loud or soft. They both accomplish something inside of music. Someone sings real softly, and you, you hear maybe some sweet tones and peaceful melodies. But you don't want to sing this. Oh, victory in Jesus. Right? How do you sing that song? Oh, victory in Jesus. So you got rhythm and loud and dynamics. Loud, soft, forte, piano. You have what's called the melody. That's the main line in a song. That would be the melody of Amazing Grace, the tune that you know. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. That's the melody line. That's the dominant type, that's a dominant um, line or tones of that song, of that music. All right, now, sometimes people cannot hear what that is. There are people who are, who are tone deaf who cannot hear that melody line. All right, in, uh, in, in college, I sat next to a young lady who had perfect pitch. What that means is that you could ask her any note and she could sing it. Sing an F, hmm, she'd sing it. Oh, I used to drive her nuts. I'd say, hey, I'd sit next to her in class, in theory class. I'd say, hey, sing me an F. No, J.D., I'm not going to sing you an F. Come on, just sing me an F. Sing me an F. No, I'm not going to sing you an F. The teacher's teaching, of course. No, I'm not going to sing you an F. I'm like, mm, mm, mm. is that an F? It's not an F, that's a G. No, no, I won't get Sing me an F. And I, I just bug her until she says, she, hmm, no, that's an F. Are you happy now? No, sing me an A. Sing me an A. It kept me occupied the whole theory class. <laughs> Some people can't hear melody. Some people naturally hear the note, and then they sing five notes away. The strangest thing. 
These, these people are, are, are a conundrum to life. <laughs> How do you do that? Some people who are tone deaf hear this, and they sing this. There are, I have found only very few people are actually tone deaf. There are some in this world. I've had some throughout the years in a patch play. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, Brad. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's tremendous. Um, <laughs> remember one time, years ago in a patch play, they're singing, and I hear this, this sound. I forget the patch song that we were singing. But I hear this person, and, and they move like this. You know, uh, I'm trying to think of a, of a patch song. You know, little by little, inch by inch, by the yard, it's hard by the inch, what a cinch. I mean, and, and they're always full of gusto. Good expression. And I'm like, do the microphone. <laughs> that's not the melody or the harmony. All right, that's utter chaos. <laughs> yeah. But there's melody, there can be a uh, conjunct melody, which can be uh, easy to sing. And there's some hymns that are easy to sing, or disjunct melody, which is hard to sing or play. Then there's harmony. Harmony is the, the sounds around the melody, right, that make it sound nice. It adds some color to the song. Uh, sometimes they, they add some, maybe some, uh, some intrigue to the song. Uh, but, in, but in harmony, you have a couple of concepts. You have what's called dissonance. All right, so if I have a note like this, harmony sounds kind of nice, right? Ah, it's relaxing. This is not as relaxing. Why is that not relaxing? Well, mathematically, the chords are, the notes are too close to each other, mathematically, just so you know. The effect is, whether you know music or not, you're like, ugh, add a couple of them. All right, and you may get harmony out of dissonance. The point of good music, just on a side note for some of you music freaks, the point of good dissonance is resolution. All right, dissonance creates an emotion and effect. I played a song once that was about the storm, the flood. Dissonant until the rainbow of the song came and it was smooth. This is like nature, like the way God created. Sometimes there's dissonance, but then there's calm. That's proper music. Any music that is dissonant just for the sake of dissonance is not proper according to nature's laws and proper equations, all right? So there's dissonance or consonants. There's tone color. You know that. A trombone sounds different than a saxophone. It sounds different than Pastor Ryan singing. There's different tone and there's different texture. And, there's, uh, and this is interesting in the texture. There's monophonic texture, all right? That's row, row, row your boat, all by itself. If you go polyphonic, we talked about that a little bit with the, with the drums in, in Ghana, um, polyphonic is not necessarily bad. If you sing, row, row, row your boat in multiple rounds, if you go row, row, row your boat, row, row, row your boat, row, row, row your boat, you know, keep on going like that, that's polyphonic. That's not necessarily wicked, right? It would be utter chaos for a couple minutes. When it's all done, ah, resolution. And then you have form. We normally sing in a form that's called strophic form. It's the same tune with different multiple verses. Most hymns are strophic style. Amazing Grace, the same tune, whether you sing the first verse, second verse, third verse, or fourth verse, right? If you don't know the words, you can hum the rest of it. Now, not every song is like that. There are songs that are binary where there's two distinct parts, and there's songs that are ternary. They have, they have three parts. They go back and forth and thorough composed. There's songs that never repeat themselves the whole song from beginning to end. All these things from music, there's a whole lot of place for confusion in that. But as you study music, or if you were to study music, you would find out that God has set up music in a, in a perfect and a wonderful way that it makes sense in order, not in chaos. And even in your body, you can feel the difference. I bet you could feel the difference when I played a dissonant note and a harmonic note. You could feel it because you've had training, because you all have degrees in music. No, because it is innate. There are some laws that God has set up in nature, in emotion, all right? Gravity is one such law. How does it actually work? Well, moon rotation, there's some things that make it pull. But ultimately, what happens? If I jump, I go down, right? Like it or not, I go down, Right? In music, like it or not, there are certain laws that are set up inside of that. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're going we're to work through. 
So I don't want us to be confused inside of music, but there are these elements that all come together. And every element brings something different to music. You see, when you turn on your radio and you hear the top 10 hits from today and it's some, some crazy radio station, maybe they're playing the, the newest hit songs out there, you're going to hear rhythm. Now, rhythm's going to try to send a message. It's going to be in proportion to the melody. There's going to be a melody line in there. It may be someone screaming it, but there's going to be a melody line. There's going to be harmony. There's harmony even in the most pagan of music. They have harmonies. It may be dissonant. It may be clashing. It may sound like war. Still harmony. Sending a message. There'll be tone color. You can turn the radio on and very quickly, hearing a couple notes, know what style of music by the tone color. If you hear this, right? You don't think, you shouldn't, this must be good Christian traditional music. Hmm. Do you? If you hear a heavy twang, right? Tone color. You're going to hear texture, the way they're, and then you're going to hear form. You can turn to a classical station and hear all of these together beautifully orchestrated, producing an emotion effect. But, but there's all these things that have to work together that God has put some strict laws in place, all right, that we can follow, we can study, we can look at. We have to understand, though, that in the effect of music, there are still the principles of music. The principles are, are these, we looked at some of them, that music influences other people. Music should flow from a knowledge of Christ, a ex spiritual expression of my joy is my music. My music should speak of victory. Music can turn my heart to things that agree with Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, and music conveys a message, and everything I do ought to turn me toward God. You say, well, pastor, what is the place of, like, music that's not, like, in church? It's a good question. Psalm chapter 90, we have the idea and the concept that the heavens declare the glory of God, right? And the firmament showeth his handiwork. There are things, I'm sorry, it's not Psalm chapter 90, it must be Psalm chapter 19, I have the wrong, the wrong passage uh, marked down in my, in my notes here. Let me get back there. Yeah, sorry, Psalm 19, I had 90 on there, but it was a typo. Psalm chapter 19. So in nature, when you go outside and you see a beautiful sunset, what do you say? What do you say? Wow. That's beautiful. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Does that mean that every tree you see, you say, wow, there's a tree, I better pray? You probably don't do that. But nature points us, and it ought to point us, a certain direction because of its beauty, because of its order, because of its intricacy. I see the hand of God upon it. And I can appreciate the beauty of nature, so the Bible teaches, in seeing the handiwork of God. If you were to turn to Genesis chapter 1, you don't have to. Genesis chapter 1, you would see that everything in nature is for us to subdue and have dominion over. We're supposed to be stewards of what nature is, including the ideas of science, why, do people, why should people study science? Well, because I'm supposed to subdue nature and, and it help further the kingdom of God. And I would argue also in music. Music can uplift in beauty and order. It should direct me in beauty and order. Does that mean that every song must be a hymn? I would argue absolutely not. But it cannot take me away from my Creator. It cannot take me away from my Creator. Understand that there is music because it conveys an art form and an emotion. It can begin to substitute for God. You see, some people, when they get into a hard spot in life, turn to alcohol, drink their sorrows away. Other people turn to music. And now, instead of the Holy Spirit bringing peace and joy in my life, music does. It would be the same if I went to a tree and said, oh great tree, 
please help me. Or, O oh, great golden calf, you are what brought me out of Egypt. It didn't represent the God of the universe. It was not of order. It was of chaos. I have studied a lot of classical music, what's called 20th century music, where they begin to rip apart all of the rules of classical music. 20th century classical music did this. They have a duet like this, a tuba, big old tuba, and a piccolo flute. They did that just to combine two elements that had no, no reason being combined. Another, another song, uh, another artist, he, he called it music. He, uh, he called a piano and a bed of nails, I think it was. And he put nails inside of a piano and played a song and recorded it, and that was music. Was it an art form? Yes. Was it beautiful? No. Was it chaos? Yes. And my Bible teaches me that, that God is a God of order, not of chaos. That's why apple trees have apples. There's an order to it. An apple tree doesn't have walnuts. There's an order to it. Trees grow like this, not from the sky down. There's order to it. The sun comes in the east, right? Sets in the west all the time, right? Why? Because God is a God of, help me, order, not chaos. The sun is predictable in how it, and how it rises, is it not? You can, I can look on my weather app and find out what time it will rise tomorrow in, Ma in Saginaw, Michigan. And you know what? It will. I may not be able to see because of the clouds. What if the sun got off kilter? Right? But it's not. Why? Because God is a God of order. We rotate. The earth rotates at the same speed, right? And it has. He's a God of order. So we have to be careful in our music that when we choose music that is outside of a spiritual realm, that we choose music that is beautiful, that is uplifting, that is of order, not of chaos and replacement. The last thing to be careful of in music, a principle that music is addictive. Music is addictive. Why do you think they sell so many hit singles albums? It's addictive. We talked about this early on. It gets in your soul. It gets inside of you. That's one reason I don't want commercials in my house. I don't want that music in my soul. Only two ways in. Eye gate, ear gate. I don't turn off those things just because there's a commercial. Well, I will stop here tonight. Next week I'd like to teach some more on this. We're about to get some questions and finish up here. But God is a wonderful God. He's given us some wonderful things. We can't turn off our minds. We can't turn off our spiritual heart. Listen to the Holy Spirit. We use our Bible. We use the Spirit to make the right choices in music. Lord, help us. Lord, as we look at this, that Lord, there's no doubt in my mind there's some people that need to make some very specific choices about music. Lord, some choices that will maybe be against what they feel but will be pleasing to you. Lord, give us the grace and strength to, to do that with your power. In Jesus' name, amen.